Looking at Mark chapter 5, I've entitled this lesson, Great Things He Has Done. Uh, on Wednesday night, Ryan and I were in our class and we were talking about this very uh, scripture. And I thought this would be a good lesson for us to discuss this evening. So that's uh, where this came from. We think about sometimes all the things that we have in life and the many ways in which we are blessed. We sometimes fail to, to tell others about how God has blessed us. We know sometimes we have those in the dimensional world who go a little bit too far with when they talk about how God has done things for them. But we think about what God has done for us. We shouldn't be shy to mention how God has taken care of us throughout the years or how God has been merciful with us or patient with us and things along, along those lines uh, would not be uh, going too far when we talk about what God has done for us. How often do we talk about things that God has done for us. If you were to think about or list some of the things that God has done for you, how long would that list be? Well, if we're very honest and really examine ourselves, our list would probably be pretty long. We can learn a lot from what Christ teaches us as we'll look at Mark chapter 5. And we'll begin by looking at Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. If you're familiar with Mark 5, you know this is dealing with a man who is possessed with a, or has an unclean spirit. So we'll begin by looking at Mark 5, verses 1 through 5. Here the Bible says, And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gardenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke in pe- and the shackles broken in pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Well, one of the first things I want to point out, and it's interesting in the Bible how names always have a meaning. For instance, the country here has a meaning of reward at the end. And when I was studying for this, I thought that's an interesting name for a city or for, for a country. Because you think about that, when we think about the phrase reward in the end, what does our mind go to? It goes to heaven for the faithful. And for the unfaithful, well, they don't really have a reward. They have a punishment. But we think about the reward in the end. I thought that was an interesting name. But I want us to back up and really look closely at, at these first five verses of Mark chapter 5. The Bible tells us that uh, when, he come, when he came out of the boat, immediately there met him a person who came out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now immediately would have us understand that as soon as he got out of the boat and, and began to walk into this area, that here comes this individual. There are certain things I want us to point out. First of all, notice where he is hanging out, where, he, where his dwelling place is. In verse 3, the Bible says, He had his dwelling among the tombs. We would say today among the cemetery. Now, that is in itself pretty creepy. Uh, if we know someone who is not in the right mind, they're hanging around the cemeteries, we're probably not going to want to spend very much time around them or be kind of uh, fearful of even approaching them in such a place. So this is his dwelling place among the tombs in verse 3. And we notice also that no one could bind him, not even with chains. Verse 4 tells us because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. So we see there not only can, could they not shackle him or chain him up, try to keep him under control because we see in verse 4 that he has often torn those things apart. How much strength does it take to pull apart a chain? Uh, we've seen that sometimes played out in movies and things, something being pulled apart, but it's not really usual for us to see or common for us to see somebody who takes a chain and just pulls it apart. So obviously this person has, has a lot of strength being uh, in him, no doubt coming from this unclean spirit. Uh, he, had, he had strength that scared normal men. We see in verse 4 that neither could anyone tame him. And also found this interesting in verse 5. 
But the Bible tells us, and always night and day he was in the mountains, in the tombs, so he's going back and forth between these two, these two places, crying out and cutting himself with stones. I remember I called up uh, Lisa's brother, Jeremy, who has a degree now, or a doctorate now, in uh, counseling, and I was talking about this person I knew who was what we call, you ever heard of someone who's what they, what they call a cutter? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there was someone who would literally just take whatever utensil may be and just cut themselves. And, and I was asking him, I called him up and asked him about some of these things, about you know, what's the purpose behind this, how could you handle someone like this, and, and things like that. And so when I read this verse in verse 5, that kind of came out to me, the idea of someone who cutting themselves with, with, with stones, they were, they were hurting themselves intentionally. Now, in this man's case, it's because the unclean spirit is within him. And as I was talking to uh, Lisa's brother about this, he really brought out the idea that uh, they, some like the idea of, of causing himself pain. I don't understand that myself. But then that's why they need help and need counseling to help them overcome those types of things. But this really reminded me of that because that's what this man is doing in verse 5. He is crying out and cutting himself with stones, no doubt because of the unclean spirit. So we really see a good picture of this man in the condition that he is in. And it's obvious he's in this condition because of this unclean spirit. But I want us to also notice Christ's effect upon the possessed man who had uh, this unclean spirit. And we'll go to the very next verse and following, verses 6 through 13. And let's look what the Bible says here in Mark chapter 5. When he saw Jesus from afar, that is the man who had the unclean spirit, notice what happens. When, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now it's interesting that who recognizes Christ right away? The unclean spirit. Or actually, we'll see in a moment, the unclean spirits, plural. We see in verse 8, says, For he said to him, Come out of me, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. That's always kind of creased me out a little bit. I think about a man, he doesn't just have really one unclean spirit, but seems to have many. Because he says there in verse 9, My name is Legion, for we are many. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. We continue reading in verse 11. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him. So there we have again, verse 12, all the demons, plural. You think about this for a moment. A man having not just one unclean spear, but having several. That man experienced a lot of torment during, for however long he had that position in his life. Those demons uh, possessing him who had entered him. So all the demons, verse 12, begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, that is, uh, uh, swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now what I want us to think about here is we want to first notice the unclean spirits, as we back up here in verse 7, they feared Christ. We see in verse 7, they saw him from afar and ran, he ran and worshipped him. Verse 7, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you. We, we could also say beg you by God that you do not torment me. They, were, they had a certain fear of Christ. But also notice that they begged Christ that he, and they asked not to be sent out of the country. In verse 10, what does that tell us about Christ? That he had power over those unclean spirits. We saw there before that uh, it wasn't just one, but it was many legion, for we are many. But also notice we jump down to verse 13. And at once Jesus gave them permission. It's clear that Christ had power to cast these demons out. And it's interesting to me, you think about this sometimes, that he begged to be cast into what? The swine. And not to be cast out of the country. I've always wondered if he didn't agree to let them go into the swine, 
where would he send them? Obviously, they wouldn't be anywhere near where, where they were at now. Uh, obviously, beyond at least beyond that country, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe back to, to the Hadean realm. I don't know, but it's interesting they begged to stay in the country, and, it's, and, to, and they actually begged to go into the swine. In verse 13, he actually gives them permission. So we see that Christ, what is his effect upon the, the unclean spirits? They're immediately afraid of him. And second of all, they have to ask permission. They actually beg Christ not to cast them away, but send them into the, into the swine. Now I want you to think for a moment, being in that area, not, not being the, the man who had the unclean spirit, but being what we call just simply an onlooker. You see Christ, maybe you've heard about before, coming to the country, and he meets the man who everybody else tries to avoid, the man who has that weird spirit, that scary spirit about him, who no one can tame. He immediately meets Christ, and what happens? The matter of moments, things change. And let's look at verse 14. We'll see really that some were afraid or did not understand his power, that is Christ's power. And let's look at verse 14 and following. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city in the country, and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. That had happened. So those who were, who were taking care of the swine, they go and tell those who own the swine, and tell them what had happened. In verse 15, and they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion. So it wasn't just demon possessed, but demons possessed him. And had the legion sitting, now notice, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Now no, what do we read next? And they were afraid. What did Christ do? Did he do some evil? Did he do something wrong to this man? No, he actually, what did he do? He unburdened this man. He released this man from the demons who were possessing him. In verse 15, they came... And they came in, in to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. So he is now what? Acting like we would say a sane person, acting normal. He's no longer running about, yelling about, he's no longer cutting himself. He's sitting down, he's calm. Obviously, he's a different individual. And now we see in verse 15, and they were afraid. And those who, who saw it told them how it happened to him. We have been demon-possessed and about the swine. So they tell them about Christ casting out the demons. I often wonder, did, were they close enough, and the Bible doesn't tell us this, but were they close enough to hear what Christ was saying? Were they close enough to hear, or could they hear what the legion, the many demons were saying? I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but we see that they obviously knew that something had changed. They see a man who had been demon-possessed. Christ comes and meets the man in a matter of moments. He's now sitting clothed and in his right mind. And now we see in verse 15, they were afraid because of it. In verse 16, those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. In verse 17, then they begged, then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. You know, if Christ came into my region and cleansed some man of multiple demons, I want to buy him a dinner. I'm going to send him away. But it's obvious that these individuals were afraid of Christ. But if they had anything to be afraid of Christ, if they had a reason to be afraid of Christ, it would be, it would be because he ignored the man and walked on, allowed him to be, remain demon-possessed. But the Bible says he didn't do that. The man came and met him. What happened? He cast the demons out. There was actually no logical reason for them to be afraid. They could have been amazed, startled, unsure of how he's able to do those things. But they should have been afraid. We see these individuals feared Christ. and knew what the man was capable of. That is, the man he was even possessed. And after hearing what Christ did, some were afraid of Christ. Now let's think about this. What could, have, what could he have done for so many others in that region? Christ wasn't asked for so many to leave and to go out of the region. What else could he have done? Well, we know on occasions where he has fed thousands of people, 
We know on occasions where he has uh, uh, brought someone back from the dead. He has healed the sick, made the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, all those things. He could have done so much more because the people were afraid. They pleaded with him to depart from their region. But I want us to notice another section in Mark chapter 5, verses, this time looking at verses 18 through 20. And why don't you notice what Christ tells this man, well, who I've called the released man, because he's been released of all these demons, all these unclean spirits. What he tells this man to do. Well, let's pick up with Mark chapter 5, verse 18. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. What did Christ tell the man to do? Well, the man we see, first of all, in verse 18, the man wanted to stay with him. You know, that makes perfect sense. The man had, had had this horrible experience for who knows how long. Christ comes and casts those things out. And we see in verse 19, or verse 18, that he wanted to be with Christ. He wanted to stay near him. And that's understandable, wouldn't you? If you had been in his position and now you're you're back in your in your right mind, you're gonna to want to stay very close to Christ. Not just spiritually, but maybe even physically. You want to be right there next to him. Notice what Christ wants him to do instead in verse 19. The Bible says, However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. You think about what Christ is wanting him to do. It's obvious that his friends wouldn't know what kind of condition he was in previously. If he goes home and he's in his mic, and he's not screaming, he's not cutting himself, and he's in his, in his right mind, they're already going to be wondering what has happened. Someone who's completely changed from being this crazed person to being a sane, normal behaving person, you're automatically going to say, "What what has changed here?" So he tells him to he tells him to go home to his friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had compassion on you. You know, one the things we have to remember about Christ and all his works is that he didn't have to fill a certain quota. He didn't have to do perform all the miracles that he did. He chose when to, to heal people, when to do things, and when uh, just simply to keep on teaching and preaching. Not to say he didn't heal those who came to him, but he didn't have to do any of those things. And that's the point I'm making. But yet we see in verse 19, he had compassion on him. And notice in verse 20, <coughs> And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. You know, there's only one reason they would marvel at what Christ has done for him, and that's because they would have known, if they would have known the man when he had the unclean spirit. If someone came in and began to tell you things like he was telling you, but you didn't know the man was, had been doing possessed, you didn't actually see it with your eyes, you may not believe it very easily. But the reason these individuals would marvel is because obviously they knew of him. You back up to Mark 5, beginning in verse 1. The man who lived in the tombs, no one could bind him, no one could, could tame him. He had a reputation. People knew who he was. But now they would know him as a man who the Lord did great things for and had compassion upon. Let's go to Mark chapter 7. In Mark 7, looking at verses 31 through 37. We have the deaf and the mute man. Beginning in Mark 7, verse 31, the Bible says, And again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Now, remember the region of Decapolis? Remember, that's where uh, the man who was even possessed went to. So he's in, he's in the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Verse 32, Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment, in his speech, and they, be, and they be begged him to put his hand on him. What are they asking Christ to do? To heal this man. 
You know, I think back to Mark 5, and I think, why were those people afraid? You know, if, if, if the man didn't come running to Christ, you would think they would ask Christ, to, hey, can you come and heal this man and cast out the spirits from this man? But here in Mark 7, they're actually, they brought this person to Christ. In verse 33, the Bible says, And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. In verse 34, Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Apatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loose and he spoke plainly. Now, I do not know why Christ stuck his fingers in a man's ears or why he touched the man's tongue or why he spat. I don't know why he did any of those things. Because the Bible doesn't tell us. We can speculate, but what we want to focus upon here in Mark, in Mark chapter 7 is that he healed the man. He made the man able to hear. He made the man able to speak. But also notice for our, for our lesson tonight, notice verse 36. We see in verse 34 and 35, we see the miracle. But notice what Christ did, what Christ told him to do in verse 36. And he commanded him at the end that they should not, they should tell no one. Now what happens so many times you tell people, shh, don't say anything yet, don't tell anybody yet. What happens? <laughs> it creeps out, right? It's kind of like baby names. They kind of creep out for a while. Well, what happens here in verse 36? He tells them, don't, don't tell anyone. Well, the natural reaction in verse 37 we see, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Why is that? Well, if you were, if you were deaf and you couldn't, you had this impediment of speech, uh, maybe not mute, but just couldn't speak where people could hear you and understand you, and now suddenly you can speak plainly, you can hear perfectly, you're not want to, want to be quiet about that, are you? You think about all the things you miss when you're deaf, you know, back in this time, they didn't have hearing aids. All things you miss when you couldn't speak plenty enough for someone to understand you. You missed a lot. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Go tell everybody what has happened. And listen, because now he could to what they were to say to, his, to him telling them about what has happened. Verse 37. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Christ did wonderful things for those two people. We know the Bible tells us He did wonderful things. He continues to do wonderful things for all mankind. We can go through and look at all the miracles that are recorded for us. However, the gospel accounts, also we find in, in the gospel accounts that uh, if everything was written down, recorded that Christ had done, that he did and said, that there wouldn't be enough books to, to hold all the things which he did. Well, we think about even moving up into today. Does Christ continue to do, as we see here in verse 37, does he continue to do things that are astonishing? Does he continue to do things that are amazing? Now, we don't mean any, in a miraculous sense. But we do know that the gospel saves souls. That through the baptism of Christ, we, our sins are washed away and made right in His sight. That is an astonishing thing because nothing else can do that. Only through the blood of Christ can our sins be washed away. So we all should be thankful for that at the very least. We see in verse 37, He makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. We could say He makes the sinner what? clean. Revelation tells us that those who receive eternal life are those who have been what? Washed in the blood of the Lamb and their robes are made white as snow. That is, those who had their sins washed away. And their robes represent their life. So their life has been washed in the blood of Christ and their sins have been washed away. <clears throat> Today, as Christians, we should be okay with telling others what things God has done for us or for you. We think about the song, Count Your Many Blessings. Sometimes when we get a little down on ourselves, we really need to stop and do that. Because we will realize that we really are a blessed people. By just being a Christian, we are blessed beyond measure. We have the ability to have eternal life so long as we are faithful to God. People today need to be reminded 
of the good that comes with being a follower of Christ. I want you to picture in your mind for a moment the person who is, you know, I'm just going to pull this out of the air, person who say he is well educated, person who uh, brings home a good paycheck, has a nice home, has a nice family, they have the wife and, you know, 2.2 kids or whatever it may be that people say you're supposed to have today. They have all those things. When their life comes to an end 70 plus, 80 plus years later, they die outside the body of Christ. What have they really gained? Nothing. They've experienced joys in life, but joys that were temporary. If we're going to experience a joy that's eternal and miss damnation and torture and all those things that we describe as hell, we have to be faithful to God. And we can, when we do that, we can tell others about what great things God, Christ, has done for us. Because as Christians, we have a lot to talk about. When we think about the things He has done for us. This evening, if you have any needs or concerns or prayer requests, you can come forward now. That's good. We stand and sing to encourage you.